final speaker, Andrew, for the panel. Our society and our economy are addicted to building. And as architects, we're complicit in the, in the consequences of defaulting to a build more philosophy. In recent years, we've made enormous strides in building smarter, though those gains are dwarfed by the consequences of overbuilding. And here we're looking at a beaver dam, as you might be able to see. Um, beavers, like humans, uh, follow a build or die ethos, but their efforts are restricted to a couple of simple prototypes which are held in balance with an, as an integral part of a complex web of life. And here we have a picture of a mountain range where there's this incredible hierarchy of information and scale, but it reads as one system. And I think there's probably even a beaver hiding in there somewhere. If we look into um, this town, Hilltown in Calabria, it looks like a bit like the hill it sits on. And that's because it's made the same material. It reads as a system, parts of a whole of its place and in sync with it. And its embodied carbon is theoretically very low as manual and animal labor were used to convert the immediate landscape into shelter for this town. When we look at Hong Kong, the modern metropolis, natural systems and formations are subsumed by architecture and infrastructure. And what is noticeable is that these buildings are made of things from all over the world and could actually be found anywhere in the world. They're all struggling to assert themselves, each one an edification of its builder's power, success, and prestige. And before I go into this idea of edification and de-edification, I do want to talk a bit about decarbonization. This is both and scenario, and we need to build less, build what we do build better. And our first impulse, it would seem, as a society, is to count our way out of this predicament. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it's not the only thing. Here we have a diagram um, that illustrates our design process, a set of very granular investigations and activities that we use to shape and drive operational <clears throat> and embodied carbon down. It's ambitious and aspirational and not all of our clients are ready for it, but with some of them, we're making really significant strides using this dual approach, this methodology. Here we have a render of the Northeast Scarborough Community Recreation Center in Toronto. It's currently in construction. It's Canada's first net zero sports and recreation facility under the CAGBC net zero building framework. That's a particular, it's a standard focuses on operational carbon, a particular challenge when we're dealing with the heavy process loads of an aquatic center. Now to achieve this ambitious target, we walk the client through a stepped approach, beginning with passive strategies, a super compact massing, relying on an innovative stacking of the program, a passive house inspired design for the envelope, active systems focusing on electrification, heat recovery, energy, energy synergies between program, smart operations, and a huge focus on on-site renewables. But we didn't stop there, and we led our client through a detailed analysis targeting embodied carbon. The areas of greatest impact, as I've already been touched on, foundations, superstructure, building envelope allowed us to reduce carbon, embodied carbon by 40% against a baseline. We gave our client a menu of options that quantified premiums, payback, and planetary benefits. So as architects, we're getting good at the deep analysis around carbon and at mapping the decisions for our clients. In a way, I'd say we were moving towards being able to answer more consistently and systematically Buckminster Fuller's famous provocation to Norman Foster, where he asked him, how much does your building weigh? Less carbon, in a way, is less weight on the environment. Now, one way to de-edify society is to build less, and there's greater humility in taking what's existing, unloved and unused, and turning it into a hub of vitality and creativity. This former dairy factory in Atlanta supported a, supports 100,000 square feet of space for culture and business startups, and the existing structure captured 5,000 tons of CO2 equivalents, added biomass and habitat, which will return to the site. The renewal of this brutalist office complex in Gatineau, Quebec, will achieve net zero operational carbon. By retaining the existing structure, we also avoided releasing the equivalent of 51,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. The site's complex history was retained as it was greened and reintegrated into its context. Now, in the next couple of slides, you'll see buildings we designed for a Canadian university. In both cases, we were asked to create an iconic gateway for the campus an edification of this institution's values and prestige. And they are also edifications of contractual agreements stating that a professor is entitled to an office with a window on any campus, one of three campuses that they teach at. The challenge is, is that many professors live in the core and have or never will use the offices in these buildings. And I wish I could say that such underutilization of embodied and operational resources is uncommon, 
but in my experience, it is not. And as we begin to count carbon as part of our regular design process, I can't help counting all of the underutilized space we've designed and continue to design. So perhaps it's time to ask different questions than those we traditionally put forward at the outset of a design. Traditionally, what do you want to build? What do you want it to cost? Where do you want to build it? How big does it need to be? What do you want it to say about you? And more recently, what are your energy and carbon reduction targets? Or how can we help you exceed those targets for the good of society? Now, would new questions lead us beyond the object or built system with its quantities and operations? Instead, help us all think about who is using the building, how often they use it, why they use it. We need to build judiciously with the greatest value in mind, moving from a what scenario towards uh, a who, when, and why. I would argue that value comes in supporting culture, the magic that happens when people come together in real space. Architects are being called upon to broaden their scopes of expertise all the time, and is counting carbon the only or best use of our talents and training in achieving these reduction targets. Can we tackle our responsibility to the global ecology from a different angle? Can we move away from designing premiated objects toward the more humble but rewarding tasks of supporting the occupation of space towards cultural, emotional, and physical well-being? We go from being designers of objects to cultural occupation strategists. Now, I'd say to do this, we need to ask different questions, such as what do you do? What is the culture surrounding what you do? Does it need a space? Do you have a space or spaces already that can serve your culture? If yes, the, do they need to be modified? And if so, how? And then more importantly, could you actually share space or share space and time? Could we design you a schedule instead of a building? So can we use our soft skills as architects to get us all to kick our addiction to hard infrastructure? I'm not trying to talk us out of a job, but rather into a new way of thinking about our ultimate responsibility to house society in the most gracious and sustainable way possible. Build smart, build light, build less, Let's call that de-edification.